There was no doubt as to Shaka's thoroughness. He had deliberately delayed our arrival so as to prepare his capital to receive us. And in so doing, he'd made use of the time to ensure that we were fully aware of his power before we met with him. Now our gifts also showed our miscalculation of the man's intelligence. He was unimpressed and mostly dismissed the items, passing them over to the royal ladies. But as would always be the case with our royal host, he would never fail to surprise us with the unexpected. Indeed, our introduction to the Black Emperor would prove to be the first of many harrowing experiences. Tell him these gifts come with the compliments of his brother, King George. Lizzie, ye see, Cunia non volizo, o vela, cum forwerno, un cosi u Giorgi. He wants to see those things on your face, Mr. Finn. Your glasses. This man does not want to see the world as it truly is. Does anybody? centuries of poets and not one of them has thought of giving the fallen angel a mirror Inkosienu George ingu muntu onjani He wants to know what does George look like Tell him tall and powerful not unlike the great elephant himself Inkosienu George Mude, upa kemi, una mandla. Aung shalega nul kunlom tula. He asks to see the wood that makes music. How the hell does he know? Because a man who is as powerful as he is has eyes and ears everywhere. Now get going. Yes, sir. If Francis thought he was playing a game of outmaneuver, then he could not have chosen a more formidable adversary. Legu <laughs> lagi. Impilo yo mundo. Gabi se zanje ne zgaba. Kweze nkos. No ma kweza balanje lba. In your country, he asks, to whom does life belong? To the king or to his subjects? In our country, each man is lord of his own life and only his own life. King included, tell him. Quella cubo, wanke o mundo, usi patelo, impilo yake, nen cosi, 
isipatelo iyayo mpilo inkosi yanthumela impilo kwanhlasele can your king make you go to war he asks yes nia fempin and can you die in war yes yebo ungava akusilona ke iqiniso lokho kushona yonke impilo ingeyenkosi then you are wrong he says your king owns life ngokufana yoke nakuleli koko ukuphila kwabantu kusezandleni zami ngakoke beningenalo ilungelo lokuthi nemphilisa ngaphandle kwami nandlove enkulu Here yeah, life belongs to Shaka. Her life belongs to Shaka. And you had no right to give her life without the great elephant's permission. He's going to kill her. What the hell do you think you're doing? In God's name, we've got to stop him. We are in no position to stop anything. What would you have me do? Just sit here and watch? Yes, Finn, that's exactly what he is doing. Isikhathini ezizayo amandla enu ufayele wasebenzise ekusizakaleni kwami nandlovu He says that in the future you will use your powers for the benefit of the great elephant Wemkobus abasebenzi bufakazi balokho nangiya abamvusi He says if we watch truly possess these powers let them prove it let them resurrect her again tell the king that we have disobeyed him once and that we will not make the same mistake again From now on our powers will be used solely for his benefit. Tell him. Uti sebe ke bawe pula kwa kanye umthedo wenkhozi bangeke besalifinda lelo phutha yengesifiso sendlobe enkhulu sebusothi kusukula manje wazibenzise amandla ukuze kuzizakale yon in call kuzoba ukusizakala kwami mina ndlove enkulu uma izinkonjane singabuveza ubuciko bamandla azo He says it's exactly for the benefit of the great elephant that the swallows must prove their powers. Then resurrect her. You're mad. No. I'm not mad. But you were when you jumped into that grave. Now you do something or you'll be digging us.
The whites are magicians, Chuck. They work with illusion. You have taught us to live in reality. Let in. Give him the box, Mr. Ogle. to win this game, we would have to play it a lot better than this. For the pieces have been set, and checkmate could mean death for all of us. Having survived the horrendous ordeal of the gift ceremony, we began to settle into the daily life at Quabble a while, which I must say was not at all an unpleasant experience. If one could turn a blind eye to the often terrifying events surrounding life at the Royal Court. We, however, contrary to our fears, were treated with the greatest courtesy. We had miscalculated the man's intelligence. It was clear that he knew enough about the Cape Colony and the Whites to make him suspicious of our motives. From the start, he adopted a conciliatory attitude, while at the same time making us fully aware of his ability to destroy us, and possibly the Cape Colony, if he so desired. Every day we witnessed extravagant ceremonies performed with a kind of military precision the likes of which would be the envy of the British War Office. It was perfectly obvious that Shaka knew the value of carefully planned dramatic events. His citadel, ominously named Kwa Bulawayo, the place of the killing, was the center of all important events. Every morning, the people were summoned in their thousands to attend court proceedings. Carefully guarded by his Ufa Simba regiment, his feared personal bodyguard, he underwent a ritual morning anointing, his body being greased down with a mixture of red ochre and sheep's tail fat. While outside in the royal area, in front of the king's huge hut, the people were assembled. He then appeared, preceded by half a dozen or so praise singers, all recounting the heroic deeds of the king from boyhood to the present. The people, in one voice, would echo the praise singers, shouting and crashing their shields. This terrifying and indeed awe-inspiring spectacle being sustained entirely at the king's pleasure. Should anyone tire before the king's signal to cease, they would be slaughtered at a whim by the Ufa Simba regiment. We noticed that the people remained untiring in their admiration. At the king's signal, the daily court was constituted and in front of all present, the law according to Shaka would be dispensed. He was the ultimate court of appeal, the sole source of law, and, like a Solomon, settled important disputes arbitrarily. The most important member of the council was Ngomani, his prime minister, whom he frequently did consult and appeared to respect. It was, however, the military side, which, as we'd already seen during the trek to the capital, was the most impressive. Regiment upon regiment of highly disciplined warriors trained in the apparently unique Shaka battle method. His generals, drawn from those early days when he was training his men himself, 
were his most trusted friends and were the only people in his domain to whom he really gave a full ear. And indeed, they were the ones trusted with the expansion of the Empire's borders. In these ranks, Shaka could not afford any form of treachery. Which brings me to Dingan, the king's half-brother, a man who few at Kwabul a while trusted. We share the same blood, Ufui. Few men know you as well as I. Dingan had managed to survive only because the king was using him to lead him ultimately to the most dangerous traitors in his midst. Indeed, unbeknown to us, Dingan was planning with Shaka's enemies. One of them, the most powerful and dangerous of them all, Zwide. These so-called swans have almost reached Guabulawayo. That is the time to strike. Let the people think that his death was caused by the curse of these white men. But Shaka's network of bodyguards is impenetrable and incorruptible. Nothing is impenetrable and incorruptible. Sit to it. So it was that day by day we were to be drawn deeper and deeper into the intrigue surrounding the king. Francis was determined to play the game in any way he could, and as long as it was advantageous to our venture. He almost recklessly indulged the king's belief in our supernatural powers, despite the fact that with every move our position became more precarious, and what was more important, it would become increasingly difficult for us to extricate ourselves from the complicated situation we were getting ourselves into. Steadfastly, I disciplined myself into setting down the events and intrigue taking place around us. Indeed, it was a world so far removed from our experience that not even the most imaginative storyteller would have envisaged what the court of King Shaka was like. As we perused the situation, three characters, three women, began to emerge as important forces at Kwabul a while. Nearly always present at important ceremonies was Nandi, the king's mother, Nkobai, the king's aunt, and Sitai, the grotesquely old and frail chief witch doctor of the realm. I suppose the best way to describe her was that she constituted the spiritual arm of his court. A bit like the Archbishop of Canterbury, I suppose, and I'm not sure he would appreciate the comparison. What have you she wielded enormous power, Admire. and no one was able to tell us exactly how old she was. Admire. Fantastic figures of hundreds of years were banded about, while her supernatural powers were exalted by all I spoke to. But it was Nandi who was to emerge as the most powerful force in a story which, as I began to piece it together, became increasingly difficult to believe. Tales of supernatural forces, great prophecies, and magical witchcraft surrounding a king's power and the making of his spear. Almost a, an Excalibur, as it were. But such was the conviction of the people who told me these fantastic events that I felt obliged to at least set them down and let my readers decide for themselves what was truth and what was fantasy. <laughs> 